We thank the Lord that you could join us for our evening service here at Calvary Baptist Church in Larkspur, California. Uh, we have begun a study on the Holy Spirit. And so this evening we're going to look at the personality of the Holy Spirit, or might put it this way, uh, the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. I'm going to read just a few verses here. Uh, in chapter 14, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, had told his disciples uh, of the Holy Spirit's coming, and then he elaborates on that. He, he tells us a little bit more. And so uh, what I would ask you to do, if you can, uh, in honor of the reading of God's precious word, if you could stand. Chapter 16, beginning with verse 5. Jesus said, But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Our Heavenly Father, we do ask the uh, to bless the reading of your word, as well as the study of your word. Lord, it's wonderful when we look around the world that we live in. We see its beauty. We see the stars in the sky, and the clouds. We see the mountains and the valleys and the rivers. We see the plant life and the animals. And there's so much of your creation that does speak of thee. You have revealed yourself in many ways. But in many other things, we cannot learn of thee through your creation. And so we thank you, Lord, that you have given us your precious word. You have spoken to us. And I thank you, Lord, because it does allow us then to know Thee more and deeper and wider and to be able to focus our hearts and minds upon who Thou art, how great Thou art. I do pray, Lord, that this series that we're beginning, that You will enable me to be diligent in my study and preparation uh, to bring to the body of Christ and others who will be listening and watching the truths that you would have us uh, to learn and to take into our hearts and minds. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will Enable each of us to grasp the truths and be blessed by them and recognize how great thy spirit is. Holy Spirit, teach us tonight. Guide us into thy truth. And may thou be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. A lot of people over the years have thought of the Holy Spirit as a, as a power. Um, I've always liked science fiction. 
uh, growing up, I read a lot of science fiction and, and uh, <coughs> was always really disappointed. I didn't watch TV when I was growing up because we lived so far out in the sticks, they couldn't pipe it into us. Uh, I think they have it now, but uh, actually they do, I know that. But uh, I, I didn't grow up with, with that, I grew up with radio. And uh, we would go to the movies and uh, science fiction in the movies was really bad. <laughs> I mean, it was, you could see the strings holding up the flying saucers. I mean, it was really, really, really bad. And then came Star Wars. I just got to tell you, when it came, I said, now that's it. That's what we've been looking for all these years. And I have found it interesting in, in seeing those films over the years. Um, probably the only film I think I've ever wanted to watch more than once. Um, that there are certain things that have a little bit of a biblical tint to them. Um, where the, those of you who are familiar with the series know that the Ewoks live on a planet called Endor. Well, Endor is a town in Old Testament Israel. And then there is the power, or not the power, but the force, the force. And the idea is that there is this force in the universe and uh, of course, when you die, you become a part of it, which is really nirvana. That's that nirvana thinking. But a lot of people look at the Holy Spirit as like they would the force. Well, we're not going to talk about science fiction. We're not going to talk about fiction. We're going to talk about the truth. And it's important that we know about the Holy Spirit. As I shared with you before, uh, when I first came to know Christ as my Savior, uh, I did not hear any messages on the Holy Spirit. In fact, I went for a long time and almost never heard the message. Uh, part of the reason, I think, was that uh, the Holy Spirit was uh, being taught and, and, and treated in a, in a way that was not really bi biblical. Uh, but that's a shame because just because somebody misapplies or uh, something they, that doesn't mean we shouldn't teach the truth. In fact, that's the time we should be teaching it more than anything. And uh, in my own study, and, and uh, I trust growth in the Lord, I began to really pursue and under, try to understand more of the Holy Spirit. It's been such a blessing. What a, what a blessing it is to know the Holy Spirit of God. Now, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, Jesus said, will not speak of himself. He will always speak of Christ. But that doesn't mean that we are not to know him. He is a part of the Godhead. Uh, and we need to determine in our own hearts and mind and understand biblically, uh, through the Word of God, whether uh, the Holy Spirit is merely some uh, mysterious, uh, wonderful power, uh, which we, in our own weaknesses, might think, well, uh, I need to get uh, hold of him, I need to get as much of the Holy Spirit as I can. Or, as we turn to the Scriptures and read what the Bible says, that we find that the Holy Spirit is a person, he is infinitely holy, he is infinitely wise, he is infinitely mighty, he is infinitely tender, and he needs to get more hold of us, not we of him. As the Bible says that when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within. We have all of the Holy Spirit we'll ever get, but he needs a lot more of us. 
Reminds me of something somebody once said years ago when I first got saved that, you know, the Holy Spirit, or, um, you know, God is in our lives, but it's like in a house. And we let him into our house, but he's only in our living room. Uh, there's plenty of rooms in our house that we, we don't open to him. Uh, as we grow in the Lord, I trust that we open more doors, we open more rooms in our lives until he permeates our whole being, until he has access to every single part of my life. You know, the, Bi the Bible says that he knows everything about us, that he knows our thoughts, our down-sitting, our uprising. Uh, he knows everything about us. So when we keep him out of parts, parts of our lives, uh, we're being foolish. Uh, and I can't imagine that uh, we would treat somebody else that way. Well, there may be somebody come to visit us, maybe, who we may say, well, you know, I'm not really, you know, sit here in my front room, but the rest of the house is off limits. Because they're eventually going to leave. But God isn't. And we want him to have total control of our lives. If we think that the Holy Spirit, as so many people do, is merely a power uh, or an influence, then we're going to look at him very differently than what the Bible teaches. And so this evening, to begin our study of the Holy Spirit, and, and we can start at different places. Normally people would start maybe at the deity, but I thought it would be interesting and important that we understand that the Holy Spirit is a person. And so first of all, the Holy Spirit has what we would call attributes of personality. Personality uh, simply defined is possessing intellect, feeling or emotions, the same, and a will. Uh, you're not a person just because you have a body. Uh, that's not the criteria. It's that we have intellect. It is that we have feelings. It is that we have a will. The Holy Spirit has intellect, he has emotions, and he has a will, and we can prove that biblically through the Word of God. If a person has intellect, they can know, and they can think, and they can understand. If they have emotion, then they have capacity uh, to love, to feel emotions. And if they have a will, then they can, they can um, decide and they can act. And all of these characteristics are marks of personality and they are all attributed to the Holy Spirit. First of all, the Holy Spirit has intellect. Uh, in, in some cases here I'm going to have us turn to portions of scriptures and then I, I'll have you stay there because we'll go to some different verses. Some I'll just read a verse to you. Uh, so if you can uh, follow along with me, I trust you can. First, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians uh, and chapter 2. 1 Corinthians and chapter 2. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit <coughs> knows, <coughs> excuse me, and searches the things of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we have the ministry of the Holy Spirit that reveals his capacity of intellect. Here in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, notice verses 10 and 11. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit possesses a mind. 
Uh, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 27, we read, Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. What a wonderful thing that is to know, that the Holy Spirit knows God's will, and he intercedes on our behalf before God. And the Holy Spirit is able to teach us as well. If you will go down to verse 13 here in 1 Corinthians, notice it says, These things we also speak, not in words of which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, if the Holy Spirit was simply a power, uh, simply an influence, then he couldn't do this. A power doesn't do that kind of a thing. He has intellect. And second of all, he has emotions. Uh, he says he has sensibility. For instance, it is said that the Holy Spirit can be grieved by the sinful actions of a believer. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Grieving. Causing the Holy Spirit to be affected by what we do. At times in your life, somebody has said or done something to you that Cause you grief. You have that emotion. You know what it's like. And so when you and I sin, we grieve the Holy Spirit. I think something we should always keep in mind is the Holy Spirit was in us, and wherever we go, whatever we watch, whatever we hear, whatever we read, whatever we think the Holy Spirit is there. Now, my wife knows a great deal about me, I think. <clears throat> she probably knows a lot more about me than I do about her. Uh, I have a, a list, I've told you, that I give out to husbands when I'm doing premarital counseling. Uh, Fifty things to ask your wife, because she already knows them about you, us guys just don't know about him. You know, what's your favorite color? And by the way, my wife's favorite color is purple. We'll stop there. Uh, but uh, the, I kind of took myself off the track there a little bit, but we, we can grieve somebody. We can break their heart. <clears throat> but what I was wanting to say is my wife doesn't know my mind. Now, I know sometimes it almost seems like that. If you're around us enough, you will hear us sometimes finish each other's sentences. Uh, sometimes we don't have to say something to each other. Uh, our neighbor uh, last year, uh, before he lost his wife and had to go to Germany, uh, we had been coming back from prayer meeting and we stopped. Uh, I saw him outside. I almost never saw him outside. Uh, in the front of the house, especially in the evening. We stopped and pulled over and wanted to know how his wife was doing. And he said uh, she was not doing well. He was going to uh, Germany the next day. And Connie, of course, as you know, is, uh, is a dog or animal lover. You know, if we lived out in the country, we would have gobs and gobs of them. Uh, but uh, she immediately says, well, who's going to take care of your dog? And he said, well, I had a friend that was going to, uh, but uh, she's going to be away. Now, Connie didn't have to ask me. She just turned, looked at me briefly, very briefly, turned back and said, we would like to take your dog. Because we know each other. I know her. I know her heart. Interesting enough, the dog spent most of his time with me. But anyway, 
not sure, I haven't figured that one out yet. We just had Georgia again, by the way, for over a month. But she doesn't know my mind. And I think all of us would be honest to say, I'm glad others don't know our minds. One of the things that I have thought of is that when the wrong thoughts come into my mind, I need to stop immediately and say, I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want that to grieve him. In Romans chapter 15, Paul says that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of love, or the love of the Spirit. He can love. And third of all, the Holy Spirit has a will. Again, here in uh, 1 Corinthians, but let's go over to chapter 12. If you remember, in chapter 12, Paul begins to talk about spiritual gifts. And uh, when he gets to that place, he'd been talking about the Spirit, and then he gets to that place in verse 11, he says this, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, and notice, as he wills. The Holy Spirit has a will. He gives out spiritual gifts. He may give one Christian one, he may give one another Christian two, may give three to somebody else. Uh, that is his own choice. It is his choice and it is his will. He has a will. Uh, the Bible also tells us, especially in the book of Acts, uh, that the Holy Spirit directs the activities of God's servants. Uh, when you read, you'll read about the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul was wanting to go to uh, certain places. He wanted to go to Asia and Bithynia. And the Holy Spirit came to him and spoke to his heart. Didn't, didn't appear anything, but spoke to his heart. The Spirit spoke to his spirit, telling him not to go. And then he gave him a dream of the Macedonian, what we call Macedonian dream, of a man in Macedonia who was calling out, Come and help us. The Holy Spirit can direct, not only does he have a will, but he directs us. Uh, in fact, if we go over to Acts and we, uh, in chapter 16, we see the Holy Spirit uh, leading Paul and his party in, Rome, in uh, Europe. In Acts chapter 16, uh, beginning with verse 6, Now, when they had gone through Perigia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mycenae, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So, passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samuel Trace and the next day to Neapolis. Now, the Holy Spirit was guiding them. Notice verse 7. But the Spirit did not permit us. The Spirit in our lives, if we will listen to Him, if we will allow Him to speak to us, will tell us, here's an open door, here's a closed door. When you're praying and asking for God's will, He opens and closes doors. Now, you may go up to the door and you may knock on the door, uh, you may want to go through, maybe that's what you want to do, where you want to go, but he may close that door, or he may open that door. That's what he did here. Uh, he closed the door, but then he opened another door, and that's what he does. Second of all, 
the Holy Spirit performs the actions of personality. Uh, here we want to turn, first of all, to John's Gospel. You're in Acts. You just turn back a little bit, uh, a few pages over to John chapter 14. Actions are attributes to the Holy Spirit which cannot be attributed to mere thing or influence or power. Let me say that again. Actions are attributed to the Holy Spirit which cannot be attributed to a mere thing or influence or power. Such actions then must be those of a person. Thus, another proof of the personality or the personhood of the Holy Spirit. If we deny the personality of the Holy Spirit, many passages in the New Testament and even in the Old will make no sense. Uh, they, they just don't make sense. You would read them and go like, well, that's, that's absurd. It's meaningless. First of all, the Holy Spirit teaches John chapter 14. And that's one of the reasons we pray, Holy Spirit, teach us. When you open the Bible, you should ask the Holy Spirit to teach you as you're reading the scriptures. The Bible says he's the author of the scriptures. And if we, if, I always like to use this illustration. When I was in high school in my day, we, one of the things in English is you had to study Shakespeare. Now, I've actually come to kind of a, appreciate Shakespeare, but that took a long, long time. But I, I have to admit, when I was in class, uh, it just, I just didn't get it. I, I couldn't understand. The, 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 you know, Shakespeare did not believe in periods. I, I don't know if you know what I mean. He believes in commas and and, and all these other you know, pieces of the grammar, but periods, apparently he missed that English class. I don't know. Because his sentences just run on and on and on and on. And you know, you get lost. But imagine this. Imagine if you're in that English class and you're, the guy sitting next to you is Bill Shakespeare. And you're sitting there reading one of these soliloquies. I think that's the right word. Is that right? Oh boy, you know, some things you never forget. That's all I remember. And you could turn to Bill and you could say, what in the world were you talking about? Wouldn't that be great? Make a world of difference. When you read the scriptures, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you. He is there to teach you to help you understand what he has written. And so here in John chapter 14, the Lord Jesus Christ says in verse 26, he says, but the helper or the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Now, first of all, he's saying this to the disciples, to the apostles. Uh, let's face it, two of these men are actually going to write Gospels. Now, I don't know about you, but three and a half years with Jesus, they didn't still remember everything. And so Jesus is promising them, when you do this, he is going to bring these things back to you. But don't think it just applies to them because it applies to us too. The Holy Spirit is there to teach us. The Holy Spirit is there to help us to understand the Word of God. I, I, sometimes I'll talk to somebody and I'll say, well, you read the Bible. Well, I can't understand the Bible. It doesn't make any sense to me. Well, the Bible tells us that if the Spirit does not dwell in us, that we are not going to be able to understand most of it. But if the Spirit dwells in us, we can. Now, are you going to understand everything the first time you read it? No. I've had the privilege of reading the Bible for well over 50 years. And I'm still learning new things, praise the Lord. Never gotten boring. 
It's never, it's never one of those things that's got like, oh, I've got to read this again. No, it's wonderful. One of those things is because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Number two, the Holy Spirit testifies or witnesses. If you go over to chapter 15 and verse 26. Again, Jesus is speaking and he says, When the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And so as the Holy Spirit came and his ministry, he testifies, he witnesses to the hearts of people as they hear the gospel, as they hear the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. That began as after Christ died and rose again from the dead and went back to heaven as the disciples went out, beginning with Peter, preaching at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was there to teach and to testify through him, give him the words to speak, to be able to minister to those so that they would know about the Lord. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, he said, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. When we get spirit, Say the Spirit comes to dwell within, and His Spirit speaks to our spirit. Look, we have a body. We have a soul. That's who you are. Your soul is who you are. Your personality, everything. And your spirit is that part of you that God has given you that communes with God. And so God's Spirit communes with your spirit and tells you that you are a believer. Because there are times when you're going to have doubts, there's times when you wonder, there's times when you fall and say, am I really a believer? But God's Spirit will speak to your spirit. The Holy Spirit guides, we are told, in Romans chapter 8, it says, for as many as are led by the Holy Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. God gave us the Spirit to lead us. We're not just left here to just walk on our own, to go through life stumbling around, wondering well, how I should live, what I should do, what I should think, how I should, how should, I should take the gospel out. He didn't leave us that way. I get a magazine. I don't subscribe to it. Apparently, I don't think you can uh, but I get a magazine. I, I've, I haven't gotten a lot, but every once in a while it shows up. It's a, I'm going to put it in quotation mark, it's a Christian magazine. It's thick. It's about this thick. And recently, last month I think it was, the month before, I got, I got an issue. I hadn't gotten one for a long time. And so I just kind of went through it. Now, there was two short editorials, and both of them actually quoted a verse of Scripture. The rest of that magazine had not one reference, let alone one verse of Scripture. This was a Christian magazine that is basically written to pastors, and they had no Scripture. I looked at the current issue. There is one reference to a verse of scripture. That makes no sense. That makes no sense. God has given us his word. If I want to know what he wants me to do, I'm not going out to the world and say, hey, what should I do? I'm going to go to God's word and allow his spirit to speak to my spirit. You know, my son's in the Navy. I cannot imagine my son going to somebody there in Guam and say, what am I supposed to do? I'm going on a new ship. The guy's not in the Navy or anything, doesn't have anything to do with it. What do you think I should do? Would you expect him to do that? Of course not. When he got to his new ship, he had never been on a ship, he'd been on submarines, you know, for forget how many years now. He, you know, he went to his chief. He said, what do I do? How do I do my job? What do you expect from me? 
He went to the one who knew. The Holy Spirit in God's word knows what we should do. And then the Holy Spirit convicts. Here in John chapter 16, again, look at verses 7 and 8. What did I say? Convict. Convinces. Thank you. She has the outline, so. <laughs> Convinces. John chapter 16, verses 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He convicts. When you were unsaved, the Holy Spirit, one of his things doing was to begin to convict you of your sin. When you're saved, the Holy Spirit does the same thing. He's the one who's prompting. He's the one who's saying, stop. He's the one saying, don't go any further. He's the one that's saying, this is not what you should be doing. This is not what you should be thinking. This is not where you should be going. This is not how you should be doing things. Now, by the way, if you say, well, I'm going to do it anyway, he'll still be there. He'll still speak to you again. This may happen two or three times, but you know you keep on doing that. Eventually, the Holy Spirit is going to go like, Okay, is that the way you want to go? Go. And then, you're where you don't want to be, you're thinking what you don't want to be thinking, you're doing what you don't want to be doing, and then the Holy Spirit comes back and said, I told you, you wouldn't listen. Thank the Lord for the Holy Spirit. When he speaks to you, listen immediately. Don't put it off. The Holy Spirit commands and directs people. Let's go to Acts now. Acts is your next book there after John. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And let's go down to verse... 29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. Now, Philip was sent by God to witness to one man at this point. He's on a road. The road is heading south out of Israel. And a caravan comes by. And a very high-powered man, an Ethiopian, a eunuch, uh, who's very high in, the, in the, the government of Ethiopia, is riding in a chariot, and the Holy Spirit speaks to Philip. He doesn't send him to this one or that one. He sends him directly to that one individual. He directs him. He says, that's the one I want you to go and speak to. And then in verse 39, same chapter, it says, Now when they had come out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. The Holy Spirit also performs miracles. Here Philip is, out in the desert, uh, along this road. He's done what the Holy Spirit has told him to do, and... He doesn't do this today, but praise the Lord, in those days, you know, they didn't have Antrek. They didn't have the 101. And the Holy Spirit took him from there and took him back to Samaria. Now, my wife saw the outline and she said, are you going to get all the way through this? Yes. So, I've got a couple more in this area and then we're going to have to bring that to a close. Um, but the Holy Spirit calls for special service in Acts chapter 13 and verse 2. 
Now, the, 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 the apostles have been going out. They have been taking the gospel out. They have been going from place to place. And one of the original places they went to um, had been in Antioch. And the church there had grown. Uh, and God used that time. Paul was teaching there and some others. Uh, and at that time, out of that group, God called some. And if you'll notice in verse 2, the Bible tells us, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The Holy Spirit spoke to the hearts of that congregation, of that body of believers, and said, Here are two that I want you to to send forth, to take a witness. And they were going to go further into Asia Minor and up into Europe. God does that. You know, what a blessing it is when God calls out of a body of believers somebody to go and serve and minister somewhere. Now, usually when it happens, we get a little upset especially when you're smaller like we are. You kind of go like, well, we can't afford to lose them. Oh, no, 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 no. But that's what he does. He, he calls us together to send us back out. And then the Holy Spirit sends forth Christians into service. Verse 4. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus, and their ministry began. That was the first of those missionary journeys that will continue all the way through the book of Acts. And then, one more thing, the Holy Spirit intercedes. We're told in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, likewise the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I'm sure many times you've been praying, you come to some need, maybe on the list from Wednesday night or somebody on your list that you're praying for, and you come to that place and you say, I don't know, I don't know what really I should pray about. How do I pray for this person? What do you want me to pray about? Now, it's easy for us to just say, well, Lord, bless them and watch over them. But that's not what the Lord is interested in. Now, he knows what that person needs. He doesn't always tell us, but what a wonderful thing to know that when we're praying, we can go to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, intercede for me. You do be the one who, I'm just asking for this, and you pray for that need. You intercede for that person. And what a joy to know that he knows what the need is, and he is going to intercede. These are not actions which could be performed by an impersonal something, but only by a personal being. There's more, just on the personality of the Holy Spirit, but we're going to stop there. Heavenly Father, this is a joy. This is a blessing in my heart be able to teach and preach on the Holy Spirit. And Lord, as you bless my heart, I pray that you'll bless thy people's hearts. And I pray, Heavenly Father, we'll have a greater uh, appreciation, a greater understanding, a greater love, uh, a greater a realization that the Spirit lives within us and He is there to help us, to convict us, to encourage us. Uh, he's come alongside us to guide us and direct us. 
Thank you for thy spirit. Thank you for the ministry of thy spirit. Thank you, Lord, that he is a person, the third person of the Trinity. And I praise you. Bless your word to our hearts, we pray in Christ's precious and wonderful name. Amen. We don't have a lot.